Hey, welcome to Intrepid Museum's live virtual programming. Uh, this is Aircraft of the Month, and I am your host, Eric Baim. I'm the curator of aviation here at the Intrepid Sea and Space Museum, once again from my bunker in the undisclosed location in New Jersey, my, my little airplane workshop down in the basement. Uh, thank you for joining me, and I look forward to hearing your questions about the program today. Uh, you can put them in the chat later on if you're watching this in a recorded version uh, later on, but if you're live, put your questions in and I'll address them at the end. Um, the museum's live streams are free, uh, and if you'd like to support us in delivering these exciting content, uh, please click on the link below in the description, and uh, we'd love to have your support. Um, today, I want to talk about an airplane. I'm going to for once, not the Skyray, uh, but uh, as I mentioned before, uh, one of the last Skyray videos is that uh, when, when the Cougar's done, we're going to put the Skyray into the aircraft restoration hangar, and somebody said, what's the Cougar? So, um, yeah, we're going to take a look at that. Let's do that, and uh, we're going to talk about our F9F-8 Cougar. Let me uh, get my funny face out of the way and pop over here, and we'll talk about the Cougar. This is one of my favorite airplanes on the deck, right? All of them are my favorite, but this one has a lot of special meaning to me and we'll get to that. Um, the F9F Panther was the predecessor of the Cougar and you may notice if you look real close, uh, the wings are folded on that, but it is a swept wing jet fighter from the mid 1950s. Its predecessor was also the F9F and the, uh, the you'll notice the lower dash numbers, anything below five, five and below, were the straight wing Panther jets. And uh, these saw a lot of action uh, during the Korean War, but uh, the Navy wanted something better. Uh, the Panther was very versatile. I'll go off and talk about the Panther a little bit. Uh, the Panther was very versatile. It was a great little jet. It was a Grumman product, one of their really first successful jets uh, offered to the US Navy. And here you see them uh, flying with the Navy Blue Angels. And uh, here's another reason this thing is especially uh, uh, meaningful to me. When I was a kid in the 60s, Panther jets, uh, I just thought it was a beautiful airplane. And I used to have these big G.I. Joes. And anybody who's uh, in their 60s like me, you remember these 12-inch tall G.I. Joes that you can actually dress. And I had, the, I had everything. I had the Jeep. I had the space capsule. But I had the Panther jet. Panther jet was not made by the company that made G.I. Joe. They actually had a, uh, a smaller company, passed it off to a smaller company here in New York City to uh, produce the Panther Jet. You can see the shape of it is not perfect. It was meant to fit G.I. Joe inside. Sadly, I left mine outside on the front yard when mom called me in for lunch and some neighbor kid who I never found who it was decided he liked it more than me and he took it. At last I saw my Panther Jet. Um, also, this was one of my favorite movies of all time and we do movie night at Intrepid and we have some different movies and I've always been campaigning to get this one on, uh, but it's, it probably would not draw a big a crowd. You have to be a real airplane nerd, a uh, real military airplane nerd to kind of want to see this movie, The Bridges of Tokori. Um, wow, it's a great Korean War film. It's based on the James Minchner book. It follows the book very, very closely, other than maybe the types of airplanes used. I think uh, I think our hero used banshees in the book, and they used uh, the Panther jet in the, in the movie. And William Holden starred in this, along with Grace Kelly. And uh, one little bit of trivia. This is why I like to do a movie night with this, because I like to do trivia. You pick out what's wrong, you pick out what's right, and any, any little uh, hidden things in the scene. They actually uh, taught William Holden, how to taxi this jet on the carrier Oriskany. Uh, most of the filming was done on Oriskany and also uh, the sister ship Kearsarge, both, both of which are sister ships to Intrepid. Uh, but they actually filmed on the carrier and it's a great film. You'll see uh, Panthers and you'll see Sky Raiders and some Sikorsky helicopters and you'll see flight deck operations and it's all very very real life stuff. It's really wonderful film if you're an airplane nerd, but uh, they actually taught the actor how to taxi a jet. I, I can't imagine. Uh, I don't think they taught Tom Cruise how to taxi an F-14, but William Holden actually is sitting in that. This is a screenshot off the film. Um, so pressing on, let's talk about the Cougar. That's what we're supposed to be talking about. Um, the Navy was flying these straight wing jets like the Banshee and the Panther during the Korean War, but they were coming up against some Soviet-made MiG-15s, a swept wing jet that was more than 100 miles an hour faster, more maneuverable at higher altitudes. It was just, uh, it was eclipsing 
the, the Navy's jets of the day. Now, the Air Force was a little bit ahead. They had things like the F-86 during the Korean War, but the Air Force didn't have to worry about speed envelopes as in landing on a carrier. So the swept wing jets, though great for high speed and uh, maneuverability at altitude and things, uh, they did not slow down to a comfortable speed where the Navy th thought they could handle them on aircraft carrier landings. Uh, but the Navy had to get on board with these jets. They needed more high performance out of their jets. And they went to the manufacturer says, what can you do for us in the swept wing department? Grumman kind of had an edge here because the Panther, the straight wing Panther was so adaptable uh, that they uh, redesigned it slightly with the swept wings. And uh, that was the F9F-6, the six, seven, and eight were the swept wing versions of the F9F. And uh, this is a picture of one of the prototypes flying just above a Panther. And you can see in this shot uh, the difference between the straight wings and the swept wings. Beautiful airplane. And so it culminated in the Dash 8 series. And you can see this was just a really a step above the Panther quite a bit. It's a whole nother generation. I can't believe the Navy let them get away with still calling it the F9F and just calling it a different version because it was a completely different airplane. Uh, you can see uh, on the nose, on the very tip of the nose, that long dark probe sticking out that is an in-flight refueling boom. The 20 millimeter guns in the, right in the nose are still there shooting underneath it, but the in-flight refueling probe was a big boost to this airplane. It was also able to carry a lot more different types of weapons, bombs and rockets and things. So uh, once again, the adaptability of the airplane is shown here. This is an F9F-8. P, the P standing for photo reconnaissance version. And uh, this is a great picture on Intrepid from um, about 1957, I believe. Uh, notice the nose of the airplane. It's a little bigger, even though the whole thing isn't in the shop. But you'll notice two big black rectangles right there. Those are camera windows. So the guns were removed. A large nose was put in and all sorts of cameras that look downwards and side out the side and also forward very versatile uh, airplane. This image comes from the family of Robert Lynn. Robert is seen standing or sitting, you know, squatting right there in the orange flight suit right on the wing route there. And a great story about Robert Lynn when uh, he had a bailout of a Cougar. If you ever come to visit the ship, and I encourage you to take in our 3D theater. One of the 3D, you'll, you sit in the chair and it, it moves with motion and it's this great animation. But one of the stories is Robert Lynn's uh, ejection and what he had to deal with. It's an amazing story. I won't go into it here because it would just take too much time. Maybe um, one month I'll dedicate it to the Robert Lynn story because it is, uh, it's a wonderful story. And uh, thanks to the family for sharing all the images that Robert brought home with him. He, of course, he did survive and he went on to uh, finish a Navy career and um, just, just a remarkable story. So, and uh, once again, talking about the adaptability of the F9F, here's an F9F-8T for trainer. And notice the, uh, the cockpit arrangement. We now have two seats. So advanced jet training was uh, taking place in these jets. Um, it is just uh, to transition from a conventional propeller driven airplane into jets. It's really helpful to have the two seat uh, configuration to help you through that. The guns are removed, uh, the forward cockpit is moved forward and a second seat's put in. I think it had to sacrifice a little internal fuel for that as well. But uh, quite an adaptable airplane. They got a lot of service life out of the out of the Cougars. And uh, here's another shot of a Cougar. This is from VF-61. This is 1956 on board Intrepid. Uh, VF-61 uh, uh, did go on a med cruise with Intrepid. And uh, this is what our airplane is painted like. We've used a different... Uh, Modex number. Notice the double zero Modex for this. This is uh, the Carrier Air Group Commander's airplane carried the double zero uh, Modex. So quite an interesting uh, image here getting ready to launch on the catapult. So let's talk about our F9F Cougar in particular. So this airplane, uh, the history on it's been a little flaky for me to find. Um, it's uh, it hasn't been real clear. Some of the records haven't been able to be found. Uh, but the airplane I did determine was standing gate guardian at the um, 
early ammunition depot. If anybody knows uh, about the geography of uh, New York and New Jersey, in this uh, little uh, capture of uh, Google Earth image, uh, to the north is Staten Island. North to the left, you can see Staten Island. Uh, there's Brighton Beach and Brooklyn, Sheepshead Bay. And of course, Manhattan would be to the north just off the image. And uh, down where the yellow star is, you could see uh, that's just to the west of Sandy Hook, very famous beach here in New Jersey uh, in the, in the Raritan Bay. But uh, if you see that yellow star, you'll see a, a long pier with uh, three smaller piers on the end. looks like a fork. Yeah, that is a Navy pier where all the ships that had to come into um, the Navy yard here in Brooklyn, they would have to get rid of all their ammunition. Last thing the city of New York needed was loaded ships coming in. So any ship coming in, and, and when the, the Navy's uh, had a very active presence in Brooklyn, bringing ships in for refurb, and they were actually building some ships there, uh, you know, they didn't want these weapons. So all the weapons had to be uh, disembarked onto that pier. And that pier would run south, a train line runs south, and you can go on Google Images and zoom in on this. And uh, you, as that train line runs south, it runs into the early ammo depot. Uh, and that's uh, still there and it's still active and still saving, serving the same purpose. But uh, this particular cougar was gate guardian at that facility from best I can tell uh, in the very early 60s. Uh, they did some configuration changes out at the base. They moved where the main gate would be, uh, probably for better security. And sometime in the mid-1960s, the airplane was removed from its gate guard duties and was uh, brought to the town of Wall Township, New Jersey, which is just down the road, just down Route 34 from the early ammunition depot is Wall. It's down there by Point Pleasant Beach, the Jersey Shore. Um, what a great thing. If you were a kid in the 1960s, I wish they gave it to my town. I grew up in New Jersey, but a little further north. Um, the, the airplane was placed in a park. They called it Airplane Park. And as you can see, here is the signing over ceremony. Uh, I believe that is uh, one of the town council members or the mayor in the center in the suit. And there's a naval officer handing over uh, a document uh, giving the airplane to Wall Township. And look at all the kids in the background. They're sitting all over our airplane. There's even a look at the uh, the girl up on the tail. Uh, if I was her parent, I would have just swallowed my tongue. She is really dangerously high up there. But this airplane was put in a park, and the kids were able to play all over it. And um, this is another shot. When we started refurbishing the airplane, the airplane was finally moved to Intrepid before I got there. I would say the best I can say really is probably around the mid to late 1990s. So this airplane was sitting in Airplane Park in Wall Township from the mid 60s to at least the mid 90s when it was finally brought up to Intrepid. And I'm sure that it had to be moved because it's probably a really, really dangerous. Uh, when I started refurbing the airplane, we had our first... Uh, our first forays into Facebook at the time before we had an official Facebook page. I started a Facebook page about this refurbishment and uh, we're talking about, about 2010 uh, was the year that this was begun. And uh, I got a lot of followers who said, Hey, I was a kid in wall township. And of course these kids are all my age. Now these are all the people you see in this picture are probably in their late fifties, early sixties now. And uh, I got a lot of comments about I had to finish my homework before my mother would let me go play on the plane, or I had to eat all my green beans before my mother would let me go play on the plane. And I had a, a, developed a relationship with quite a few of these folks down in Wall Township who remembered the airplane. Uh, one of them sent me this photograph, and uh, not sure of the year, uh, but it was probably in the mid 1970s, maybe the early 70s. And you can all already notice there's degradation. If you saw when it was signed over, it was a complete and total airplane, but now the center windscreen is missing. The bulletproof glass that was in the center is gone. The canopy is closed, but there's a young person in the cockpit standing up on the seat, uh, possibly the seat because the seat ended up missing also, uh, but all the canopy uh, plexiglass was completely broken out. And then you'll notice some holes along the side of the fuselage where some access panels have been removed and disappeared. Um, so degradation already started. And there are some other photographs uh, that I haven't been able to find. Uh, they're, they're in my desk back at the office, but um, uh, that show it even worse as years progressed. So it was moved to Intrepid. And uh, the way I found it in 
when I arrived in 2005, it was in storage underneath. I was on the pier underneath some tarps. The F fuselage was removed. The wings were removed. And this is basically what the main fuselage looked like. You can see there's some big holes. The windscreen is now completely gone. The canopy is completely gone. The nose cone is gone. And uh, it was just a real wreck. And my predecessors didn't take on uh, this challenge. They probably didn't have time. This was going to be a very time-consuming project. Uh, when we uh, closed the ship for two years between 06 and 08, we worked on a lot of the other airplanes. We had actually dis disassembled a few and sent them out to Ohio to be uh, repainted by the Tamarios company because we had a, a nice donation and we had to spend that money. And... Uh, Got a lot of airplane work done while we were closed. And then when we re reopened in 2008, we finished up a few other projects. And I finally thought I had the time. I had a staff member now. And I also had a very large cadre of volunteers, mainly from uh, Vaughn Aviation College up in Queens over by uh, LaGuardia Airport. And so I, th I thought it was time to just drag this in and start work on it. And uh, I have at least a thousand photographs of the progress of this airplane and I won't bore you with them, but uh, here it is. Uh, this is when we first got uh, lots of amazing stories with this. I found on eBay, I found the three piece windscreen. I found brand new in the box, made in the factory, sealed in 1956 in the box windscreens. Unbelievable, found them on eBay for 50 bucks. Uh, it, that it's just such, such a, an amazing find. Uh, we will put those on. This photo shows you can see some. It's kind of splotchy looking because we're re fixing holes, and whenever there's a hole and a repair, it's got a shot of primer on it, so you can you can see where all the holes were. We're by just counting the primer patches. Um, here we're getting ready to install the horizontal stabilizer. And I think uh, one of my questions is why was this airplane retired? And I think I figured it out when we went to install the horizontal stabilizer. It's got three bolts that hold it on, two at a pivot point, because the thing does pivot for pitch trim, and a forward attachment point that goes to a hydraulic actuator that can the pilot can control and actually move the pitch on this for pitch trim. Um, nothing would line up. You could get two out of the three, any two, out of the three bolts in, but never the third bolt. It was just something was wrong. Something was very twisted. We used a forklift and we strained it and wrapped straps around it and we did some twisting and we finally got all three bolts in to make sure that was secure. But when you stand behind this airplane, you've got to stand about 20 feet behind it and you hold up a straight edge vertically against the trailing edge of the, of the vertical stabilizer, you can see it's got a very nasty twist in the tail. I think a pilot may have overstressed this airplane and twisted it. He was probably lucky to get it back on the ground or back on the deck of the ship, wherever he was flying from. Uh, and they, they probably deemed the airplane unrepairable and just retired it. And that's how it ended up as a gate guardian. So I, I, I'm only uh, I'm only making a guess at this, but that tail is definitely twisted, and it's not really noticeable to the to the average person. You you really have to stand behind the airplane with a straight edge to see it. So uh, some more shots, just showing you the condition of this thing as it came to us. You can see there's holes in the wings, the wingtip lights missing. There's a huge dent. Uh, there's uh, some corrosion control work being done. You can see there's some skin removed uh, towards the wing root. Uh, more typical damage, there's a, a fuel jettison vent out the wingtip and it's completely crushed. This wing was dropped probably when it was first removed and uh, just all bent up. And you could see that the whole thing has a layer of corrosion on it. We had to completely buff this thing down before priming and painting it. Uh, here's some shots of some volunteers. Um, the, uh, the young woman in the photo on the left, she was a volunteer, and I believe she is now one of the engineers who works for Cessna Corporation designing uh, corporate jets. Uh, in that same photo in the background is our very own Peter Taraka, who started out as a volunteer. The first airplanes he worked on was the Cougar. And uh, when we finally had a job opening, we were able to bring Peter on board, and he's been there oh, for uh, about 10 years now. Uh, the two guys... Um, the other photograph, uh, that's uh, Eric and Nick. Uh, both these young men were uh, Vaughn Aeronautical College students at the time, and both now today are captains 
in the airlines. Wonderful young men at the time and even better uh, older men today. But there you can see them riveting a patch together. Love their volunteers. Here's the uh, horizontal stabilizer finally installed, the stub of the vertical uh, above it installed. Uh, the only thing left to go on is the fairing panel. And uh, remember the nose cone was missing. We did find the lower half of the nose cone. Uh, we simulated some 20 millimeter cannons. The uh, the cover above, you see it outlined in white there, that's white sealant. That was completely missing, that radome. Uh, we had to uh, fabricate that from scratch. And the way I did that is I carved uh, from solid block foam, I carved the shape and laid it up in fiberglass. And I was very proud of that little project because it came out just smooth and beautiful. Uh, fiberglass nose cone replacement. And also the in-flight refueling boom had to be scratch made from that. And here's just some pictures of the volunteers. Uh, this was the day we finally got the airplane in one piece and uh, we could finish sanding it and uh, get ready for color coat. Uh, but uh, we, we found the canopy, found the windscreens, uh, things we didn't find, we had to make. And there was a lot we had to make on this, uh, including flaps, uh, major structural panels, uh, great fun project. And here we are in the process of painting. This is in our old tent. We now have the new aircraft restoration building, but we used to work in a tent and that, uh, luckily, uh, we don't have that anymore, but we did get a marvelous things done in that tent, including this cougar. Notice how we have the uh, national insignia. We have painted white on the nose and we're, it's a, a process called back masking. So instead of putting light colors over dark, we painted the light first, you mask them and then paint the dark. It worked out really well. Painting in progress and the finished product. And uh, that's how it rolled out on the, the Saturday before Memorial Day in 2011. And I mentioned earlier that I had made some friends with uh, the kids. I called them my Wall Township kids, my uh, 50 year old kids. And um, we actually invited them up for the rollout. Uh, this is the rollout ceremony. We could see a little bit. There was a big crowd there, a little bit of the crowd uh, off to the left there. But we we uh, towed it out of our tent with our, all our volunteers watching. It was just a gleaming, beautiful airplane. And uh, there is about half of the contingent that came up from Wall. Uh, these were uh, most of those adults you see there were some of those little kids you saw climbing all over that airplane in the previous picture. And they came up with uh, their kids and grandkids. Uh, we just had a really wonderful reunion with them and their airplane. And I am open to questions. If there are any. If not, uh, if you're watching this um, in uh, its uh, recorded version, which, which is going to pop up on Facebook later on. Uh, if you do have any questions, just put them in the chat. We check that periodically, or you can email us directly uh, from the website. You can find our, our uh, email address. And I'd uh, love to get your questions. Any comments about uh, maybe doing a, a film series would be great. I'd like to find some support for that. Uh, don't think it would be super successful. There's just not enough airplane nerds in the neighborhood. But i um, like to get some comments on that and comments about what you would like to see in uh, – the any of the aircraft of the month in the future. So there's the Cougar and its process being fixed. I hope you enjoyed that. It was great fun for us back in 2010, 2011. And uh, I'd love to do another one of those. Uh, Sky Ray is going to go through a process like that, but it's not near as bad a shape. It's going to be uh, rather quickly, probably less than a third of the time needed for Sky Ray. Anyway, uh, that's it for me. Look forward to your questions and I'll see you in two weeks. Bye-bye.